Hi, I'm David Bush and welcome back to Bush History. We are doing the sixth president of the United States today. We are doing John Quincy Adams. Many people like to refer to him as Quincy Adams because it's uh, easier not to confuse him with his dad that way. But if you've been watching these presidential videos, you know they're fairly short and they're very concise in terms of the material. It's not meant to be a big discussion and a lot of in-depth analysis of the president's administration. Just merely what happened and a brief explanation and we're going to move on and do one at a time to get them all done. So. John Quincy Adams, let's take a look. Sixth President of the United States. Certainly, he's elected uh, following James Monroe. Sixth President of the United States, his Vice President is George Clinton. He was a member of the Democratic Republican Party, and he had a term of office of 1825 to 1829. One-term presidents signify some kind of oddity. Generally speaking, a president wants two terms, and the whole idea that we have one term president means something didn't actually go right. Anyway, who came before him and who came after him? What were their political parties? James Monroe was before Quincy Adams, and after him was Andrew Jackson, a rock star, certainly. The Corrupt Bargain, 1824 goes along with whether any unusual circumstances surrounding his ascent to the presidency. Well, the election of 1824 was a four-way race. And any time you have more than two candidates involved, you have the potential for hijinks and problems. And that was certainly true in the election of 1824. Quincy Adams figured he was a shoe in He had been James Monroe's Secretary of State. And if you follow the logistics and the line, it seems like it would be logical that he would be the next President of the United States. What he didn't anticipate was Andrew Jackson, and Andrew Jackson being a huge thorn in his side. Anyway, we have a four-person race for the 1824 election, and because no one gets a clear majority of the electoral votes, we end up in the House of Representatives. Now, Andrew Jackson had the majority of the popular votes, but not a majority of the electoral votes. He had more than anybody else, but not a majority, meaning more than 50%. So we end up in the House of Representatives, and the House is going to decide this. And interestingly enough, the 1824 election is the first election in which the popular vote is actually reported. Prior to that, it was only the electors, so you couldn't gauge your own popularity state by state on a nationwide level, but now you could, and that was very important to Andrew Jackson. Either case, we end up in the House of Representatives representatives, and in the House of Representatives, we come down to a battle between two people, Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. Henry Clay had already dropped out because he had the fewest amount of popular vote, and Henry Clay makes this huge bellicose speech in the House of Representatives asking his supporters to support Quincy Adams, and sure enough, they do. And the House of Representatives gives the presidency to, to Quincy Adams in spite of the fact that Andrew Jackson had more popular votes and more electoral votes going in to this debate in the House of Representatives. Well, once Quincy Adams becomes president, what does he do? He turns around and makes Henry Clay his Secretary of State. And as a result of this, Andrew Jackson says, there's been some kind of corrupt bargain here, some kind of deal, clearly. And Andrew Jackson goes on a four-year war path against Quincy Adams. Anyway, that's how Quincy Adams becomes President of the United States. We don't know if that bargain actually occurred. It certainly seems to be the case. But anyway, Andrew Jackson certainly thought it was the case. Are there any catchphrases associated with Quincy Adams? Well, we have the corrupt bargain. And as a result of the corrupt bargain, he called his presidency four miserable years. When he left office, was it by choice, defeat, natural death, assassination, etc.? Well, he wanted to be president again, but he was destroyed in the 1828 election by Andrew Jackson. Domestic issues and events. Well, we have the corrupt bargain, which actually occurs during the Monroe presidency, but it hovers over the Quincy Adams presidency. We have the fact that he endorsed Henry Clay's American system. Well, after all, Henry Clay was his Secretary of State. The Erie Canal was complete in 1825, an example of state-sponsored internal improvements. The Tariff of Abominations, 1828, John C. Calhoun called it the Tariff of Abominations. And what he meant was a tariff that was grossly unfair on the South that benefited the North. Remember, 
Our protective tariff raises the price of imports. Well, the South, being primarily agrarian in nature, needed lots of imported goods, while the North was much more self-sufficient. So hence, the tariff of abomination. And what happens as a result of that, John C. Calhoun writes something called Exposition and Protest. It's a pamphlet he writes anonymously in which he exposes the tariff as being unfair and is protesting it. And during the time period of 1825 to 1829, Andrew Jackson campaigned for four full years that he was going to turn around and he was going to be president in 1828. And by gosh, he got it. Um, foreign policy events, well, not much because Quincy Adams was so busy being an ineffective president. However, we did not participate in the Panama Conference in 1826. Simone Bolivar wanted a conference in Panama to kind of unite Central America. And it never really occurred. And we did not attend that conference. So it was what we didn't do more than actually what we did. And <clears throat> It was blamed on the Jacksonians' obstruction in Congress that the Jacksonians didn't believe that we belonged as part of that conference. Anyway, so Quincy Adams endures four years and out. And next up will be Andrew Jackson. For Bush History, I'm David Bush, and have a great day.